Good morning, church family. It's so good to be with you today. It's always a privilege to lead you in worship. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or online with us in your home or somewhere else, uh, we're glad you're here and you're important to God. God's been waiting for you to come and worship today. That's the highlight of God's week is when people come to worship God. So uh, we're all glad that you're here. Since family is important to us, one of the ways that we can help each other is by putting our name tags on, uh, and then people feel like part of the family because they can know, they can call you by name. So wear your name tags. That's a great thing. And uh, if you don't have a name tag, you can note that on the Connect card, the card that's in your bulletin, or you have one on online that you should fill out also. Fill that, fill that out. If you need a name tag, go ahead and indicate that, and we'll get you a name tag order. You'll have it next week. You can put those Connect cards in the offering plate this morning, uh, and uh, then uh, they help me to know who's here. And if you, get a, if you get a note, if you've been here every week and you get a note from me saying I've been missing you, uh, it's because you haven't signed in, and sometimes my memory's not so good. Uh, but, uh, so please sign in so you don't get those notes. Imagine a world with no forgiveness. A world where grudges and resentments fester. Where mistakes last forever. Where bad decisions can haunt us for the rest of our lives. A world where everyone is stuck and no one can move on from what happened. That's not a world I want to live in. That's not the world God wants us to live in. As we prepare for worship, ask yourself what kind of world you want to live in. And how... Forgiveness makes a difference in your life. Let's prepare for worship as we listen to the prelude. Good morning, church family. If, if all who are able would please rise and join me for the call to worship. We come to worship the God who created us. We are people made in the image of God. And what is God like? God is gentle and wise, full of peace and full of mercy. We come to worship the God who is creating us. God is, God is making us gentle and wise, full of peace and full of mercy. Thanks be to God in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we have an opportunity to lift up our, our prayers of thanksgiving and concern. Uh, one of the joys that I noticed today is that we've got uh, a couple, I think they're new people in the bell choir. Have you been here before? Nope. 
a couple new people for the bell choir, and Robin's joined the bell choir. Looks like everyone else has been here before. Okay, yep, we got some some other new people in the bell choir here. So, uh, so what? Is, I'm thankful for everyone that's in the in the bell choir today. Uh, we also have some other guests here, and if you're a guest, please write on that connect card I talked about your name and information so that we can contact you if you'd like. Uh, another prayer concern that I have is it's a joy, really. It's a joy. We have uh, a ton of kids coming on Wednesday night, and we only have half a ton of volunteers. Children's ministry is one of our, uh, our prides and joy. We give, we give thanks for all of the children and the ministry that we have for them, but Susie really needs another volunteer or two to help on Wednesday night. At this point, uh, we're going to have to turn children away if they, if they uh, come on Wednesday night that they haven't already been here. So uh, we need people to volunteer. So if you can volunteer, even if you can volunteer once a month, let Susie know because someone else might be able to volunteer once a month and, and we'll get it all worked out. So it's like from uh, 3.30 to 5 on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, we really need your help. And uh, some of it might be snacks. It might be playing games. There's lots of things that can be done. We'll find something that fits your abilities. So please prayerfully consider what you might be able to do for our children's ministry. A concern that I have, I know I'm trying, I'm, I'm almost stealing all your fire, but I want to get this one out so that, so that people have the information. Sandy Hopper fell on Friday night uh, down the stairs and received a uh, brain injury, a head injury. Uh, she is in Des Moines uh, in intensive care and... Um, and it's a very serious situation. The in, latest information I have from Dave this morning is that they have uh, roused her from sedation because that's what they do when this happens. They, they sedate the person to try and give the brain a rest. They've roused her from sedation. She's been able to answer some questions or respond to them at least. Uh, and that's a really good sign. Uh, so we're thankful for that. But we want to lift up Sandy and Dave and their children uh, in prayer and also... Uh, we had one of Sandy's friends come, come to join us this morning, so uh, everyone's concerned about her, and we just want to, to lift them up in prayer. I'll be over there this afternoon. Other things that you want to lift up today? Happy birthday. All right. Roseanne. The Bill Bloom family. We want to lift up the Bill Bloom family. That funeral will be a week from Thursday. A week from this coming Thursday. Uh, there's been a little bit of confusion if it was this Thursday or next Thursday, but it's a week from this coming Thursday on the 19th, uh, so you can gather around them at that time. Ukraine, Jerusalem, uh, terrible, terrible news coming out of, out of those places this weekend, and we want to lift all of them up. Afghanistan uh, with the earthquake this weekend. Uh, there are lots of places around the world that need our prayers. If there's nothing else, would you allow me to lead you in the prayer? Almighty God, who taught us not to pray just for ourselves, but also for others. We pray for others everywhere in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. As your children and citizens of the world you, you created, we pray that all people would come to profess your holy name, to trust your steadfast love, and to live together in your peace. Lead all nations in the way of justice and peace, O God. Especially today, we pray for Israel, Palestine, for the Ukraine, for places that are at war and have been for a long time. Give those leaders hearts for peace. We pray especially for families of innocent victims in Horza, Ukraine, where there was a terrible attack this weekend. And for all the innocent people anywhere who are in the path of violence. We pray for victims of natural disasters like the earthquakes in Afghanistan. As people who stand in need of your love and mercy, O oh God, we pray for comfort for all who sorrow or are troubled, who live in poverty, sickness, or grief, especially those known to us. We lift up especially Sandy, and she's in the hospital today. We pray for healing, for her comfort, for her family, for the Bill Bloom family as they grieve, for others who are grieving or having medical trouble at this time. Heal them in body, mind, 
our circumstance, working in them by your grace, wanders beyond anything that we may dream or hope, O oh God. We pray for your church. We seek to love you in all that we do. Have mercy on our efforts and bless those to whom we reach out. Help us to be hope and light to all your people. All of this we pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. scripture this morning comes from a couple of different books in the Bible. The first is James chapter 2 verses 8 through 17. You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are, and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point, has become accountable for all of it. For the one who has said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as though those who are to be judged by the law for liberty, for judgment, will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have no faith, but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 32 through 38. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? 
for even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you have hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. I never really planned to tell this story in a sermon. I've preached lots of sermons on forgiveness, but it's really hard to stand up and admit how hard forgiveness is for me. But I think I'm not different from a lot of you. And I tell the story because I learned a lot from the situation a few years ago. It started in a previous church late one evening, 10 or 11 o'clock. I received an email from a member of the church, someone who I considered a friend. In fact, we had treated this person as a member of the family. And I still don't know what precipitated the email, but it was one of the most gut-wrenching, difficult things I've ever read. And her timing was perfect. Because this was like 10 or 11 o'clock, and by 5.30 or 6 o'clock the next morning, I was headed off on a mission trip. So I had all week that I tried to put this out of my mind, but you know, it's almost impossible. When I arrived home, I tried to connect with her, but she was unwilling to sit down and talk, let alone reconcile. I was hurt. I was angry. I wanted an apology. I wanted her to feel bad. And I'm ashamed to say I wanted her to hurt as much as I was hurting. I'm ashamed to say that, but I think some of you probably have a story much like that. R.T. Kendall, the longtime pastor of Westminster Chapel in London, tells a similar painful story of a person he considered a surrogate father. He couldn't talk to anyone in the church about what happened, so he talked, talked about it over length with a friend who was visiting from Romania, an evangelist named Joseph Son. After he poured out the sore details of how this man had hurt him, he paused, waiting for Pastor Son to put an arm around him and say, R.T., you're right to feel so angry. What happened to you is awful and unforgivable, and you have every right to spew venom back at that man. Except that's not what R.T. said. Um, that's not what Son, Pastor Son said. After listening to all the details, Pastor Son simply said, Ray, you must for totally forgive him. Pastor Kendall, at that point, really thought the pastor's son must have gotten distracted and not heard all the details of how badly he had been hurt. So he started over again telling the story. And pastor's son stopped him and said, no. No. You must totally forgive him. Release him and you will be set free. Release them and you will be set free free. This whole series might be summed up in those words. Release them and you will be set free. For this series of sermons, I'm defining Christian forgiveness as a decision, a decision that we make up here, a decision not to imprison others or ourselves in the past so that we can be free today. It's a decision, a conscious choice to release others from the sin that they've committed, from the harm they've caused us, so that we can be free. Release them, and you will be set free. Which sounds great until like Pastor Kendall or like me, you're faced with a situation where you're in need of forgiving someone. As C.S. Lewis said, I said last week, everyone thinks forgiveness is a great idea until they have someone to forgive. And then it's much harder than it sounds. Just a moment of review. I think this might be one of the most important and difficult series I've ever preached. And last week, 
I was teaching about unforgiveness, how unforgiveness will kill you physically, emotionally, spiritually. And as recipients of God's wonderful forgiveness, forgiving grace, we're commanded to forgive others. Jesus said, you have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Jesus is very clear about the importance of forgiveness. Remember the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, that line that we talked about, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, is to ask God to do unto us as we have done unto others. Do we really want that? To forgive us only as much as we have forgiven others. Well, that seems fair in one way. So the question becomes, how do we forgive others? How do we offer this forgiveness when we're hurting so badly? How do we forgive a spouse who's betrayed us? How do we forgive the person who took advantage of us as a child? How do we forgive the person who took our loved one from us or maybe worse did unspeakable things to our children? How do we forgive the mass shooter, the drunk driver, the child pornographer, the child who broke our, our heart, or the preacher who failed us? How do we forgive our neighbors and our friends who have betrayed us? The, the precondition for forgiveness, the precondition for being able to forgive is to give up the expectation that they will ask for forgiveness. We have to give up the idea that they will ask for forgiveness. They have to, we have to give up the idea that our forgiveness is dependent on them asking for it. They've already proven themselves untrustworthy. Okay? Why would we ask them to take the first step in forgiveness? Why would we ask that person who's harmed us to take the first step in this process of forgiveness? We cannot wait on them. We cannot ask, wait for them to ask for forgiveness. We have to give up the idea that they're going to want forgiveness and just decide to forgive on our own. We have to decide. Remember, it's a decision. It happens in our heads. It doesn't start with the other person. It starts with us. We have to decide to forgive. To tell you the truth, I thought I had already forgiven this woman I talked about. Uh, but then sometimes the anger and the resentment comes back like bad pizza. As a spiritual exercise, I tried to write a letter of forgiveness. I, I thought I had this forgiveness thing all under control. But as I wrote, deep wounds began to open up and I discovered that I had to forgive all over again. And it was much harder than I thought. I started my letter of forgiveness that day probably three or four times. It seems like it always started something like, Dear so-and-so, you, can ima you can't imagine how much you hurt me, how unfair and how cruel your lies were, how it affected my family. Does that sound like a letter of forgiveness? It really doesn't, does it? It doesn't to me anyway. So I crumpled it up and I started over again. As I sat in my favorite spot in the corner of the chapel... I settled into the pillows and I started again and I read it back to myself and it was something like, you lied, you gossiped, after all we meant to each other, you stabbed me in the back. Does that sound like a letter of forgiveness? Not so much. It sounds like a list of charges, doesn't it? My pulse rate went up and I realized that I was trapped. I was trapped because I was still keeping myself trapped in the past because I hadn't let them go in the past. I was keeping myself imprisoned by unforgiveness. I turn my letter into a dialogue prayer, and sometime I need to teach you about dialogue prayers. It's a wonderful way of praying. So as I dialogued with God, I could almost hear God audibly asking, do you understand how much she was hurting? Do you see how scared she was? Do you understand why she did that? Do you see that she too, get this one, do you see that she too is my beloved child? Slowly, the first step in forgiveness dawned on me. I had to rehumanize her. I had to rehumanize the person 
who had harmed me. I had to stop thinking of her as a knife stuck in my back and start thinking of her once again as a child of God. Our second step in forgiveness, our first step in forgiveness, is admitting that the person who harmed us is a real person. We tend to label them and make them seem less than human, uh, the enemy, the perp, the animal. We childishly call them names, but that doesn't mean that they're any less loved by God. We have to remove our attitude that keeps, that keeps us from rediscovering and recognizing that the other person is human. We make mistakes. We hurt each other. But that's part of being human. Let's be clear that recognizing their humanity does not in any way diminish our pain. It does not make it hurt any less. Actually, recognizing their humanity and affirming God's love for them might remind us that we are more like them than different from them. And that can hurt even more. It's hard to swallow. We're more similar than we are different from those who harm us. It acknowledges that at the root we are all brothers and sisters even when we hurt one another. Now if you read Matthew 5, you'll see that the first thing Jesus says is, you have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. He doesn't say like them. He says agape them. Love them as God loves you. Unconditionally, no matter what they've done, love them enough to see them as a brother or sister created in the image of God. And that's absolutely essential in being able to forgive. As I went back to my prayer, I found myself softening and starting to see that person from God's perspective. But something was still holding me back. If, if only she understood how she hurt me. If, if, she, if she only just understood how much she damaged me. She should, she should suffer in the same way that, that I've suffered so that she can understand that. I, I'd like some justice, you know. I wanted, I wanted some justice in this thing. But expecting justice or anything else from the other person prevents us from effectively forgiving. We cannot expect anything from the other person before we forgive. Our forgiveness cannot be contingent upon their behavior. Lewis Smead says that the second stage of forgiveness is surrendering our right to get even. Surrendering our right to revenge. I don't think I wanted revenge so much as I wanted an apology. But we, can, but we cannot hold out with the expectation of an apology or repentance or punishment or anything else. The person might have consequences. Okay, There are consequences to our sins. They might have consequences like they might lose friends. They may spend time in jail. The, but we have to give up our expectation that there will be consequences. We have to give up our right to expect justice. Jumping down to verse 45, we see that Jesus says, You are children of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The righteous and the unrighteous. Us and them, them and us. God loves us all. If we're both children of the same heavenly Father, it's not our job to punish them. We must give up our claim to justice and in so doing, let them out of the prison of the past. So the second step in forgiveness is letting them out of the prison or giving up our right to justice. We start seeing them as human and we give up our right to get even. And then I finished my prayer by praying for the same thing for her that I wanted for myself. I started praying for, for the same thing for her that I wanted for myself. I prayed for God to fill me with love, and I prayed the same for her. I prayed to, for God to release me from this, and for God to release her from this as well. 
I prayed for our trust to be restored. I prayed for God to repair the foundations of both our lives that have been shaken by this event. I prayed for God to heal both of us of our pain. And I prayed for God to forgive both of us and fill us with joy and hope. And you know what? Praying for blessings for the people who have harmed us starts to change our hearts. It starts to change our attitude toward them. I started to let myself out of the prison of the past. I noticed, noticed that I, I didn't say it changed me. It started to change me. I said God began to change my heart, my attitude, my mind, my viewpoint. Feelings are feelings. Okay, We can't control our feelings. But think about our definition of forgiveness. It's not based on our feelings. It's based on a decision we make up here. A decision we make not to imprison ourselves or others in the past. Not a feeling. A decision. If we wait until we feel like forgiving, we'll never forgive. I admit that my gut still gets knotted up a little bit thinking about this person who, about whom I've been speaking. But God is changing me day by day. God is healing me day by day. It's said that you'll know you've reached total forgiveness when you're able to ask God to bless those who have hurt you so deeply. That's a high standard. Not only to forgive them, not only it's not a forgive and forget, it's a forgive and bless. All forgiveness, whether we are the forgiver or the forgivee, ultimately comes from God. And God is the source of all blessing. I told you, those feelings still keep coming back. I can feel a knot in my stomach right now, just talking about this. They, they, they keep coming back. It's a, it's a decision, not a feeling, but we can't always control those feelings, so those feelings keep coming back on us. And in spite of the decision we've made, we may need to forgive again and again and again. It's kind of like an onion. You know, forgiving is like peeling off the outside of the onion. We push it aside and we think we're done with it. But then all of a sudden, somehow that onion creeps back in front of us under our nose. And we've got that stinking, rotting onion in front of us again. We have to peel off more layers and push it aside. And it shows up again. Peel off more layers and push it aside. Maybe for the rest of our lives. We can't be sure that our unforgiveness will not come back. But if it does, we forgive again. And again. And again. The bad thing is, it keeps coming back. The good thing is, we get lots of practice in forgiving. So three steps to forgiveness. Humanize the other person. See them as a child of God. Let go of your right for revenge. Your right to judge. And finally, Revising our attitude, re, finally changing our attitude toward them so that we can pray for God to bless them over and over. Let's take these three things, what we've learned, and listen to another powerful story of forgiveness. My uncle was full of life and just so much joy. He loved to find the simple things in life and to just enjoy the present. And I so admired that about him. And I knew he cared immensely for me. And so um, when he took his life, <laughs> I was shocked. We showed up at the house and there were cops and sirens and a lot of noises and lights. And we pulled up and I, I just remember knowing that he had died. So that was really hard. My life started to spin out of control at that point. I just started to make decisions about what I was gonna do. And so I started drinking and I started 
doing drugs and I started to get into really unhealthy relationships and I made a lot of poor decisions. It was like this perpetual cycle I couldn't get out of. And I had tried everything and nothing was working. So there was one day that I was handed a book called Echoes of Mercy by Nancy Elkhorn. She's the founder of Mercy Ministries, a place where women can go and find help and healing through Christ. And so I read the table of contents of this book, half the first chapter, and um, in that moment, I knew that either I was gonna go to Mercy and walk through this process, or I was not, and I didn't know if I was gonna live to see the next summer. Something inside of me started to believe that I could get better, even though I didn't think it was possible, something in me started to believe that. One of the first steps at Mercy Ministries is to walk through forgiveness, and so I made a list, and my uncle was on that list. So that was really hard to forgive him for making a choice to walk away from my family. But I did, because I learned that forgiveness is a choice and not a feeling. And after I'd walked through forgiving the other people in my life, I still felt like there was something stopping me from more healing. I knew, like in that moment, that I had to forgive myself for the last 10 years of my life. And so I was praying one day and I was like, God, oh, what is this? Like, I'll do whatever it takes. Like, I got nothing left. And I had a picture come to my mind. And I saw Jesus on the cross. And I saw myself screaming at it and pointing and saying, that's not good enough for me. But I knew the promises in the Bible and I knew that God was gonna be faithful if I was willing to walk through forgiving myself. It was as I walked that, the Lord like brought hope into my life and, and joy and like, I just, I can't put it into words. It's like I can dance for the first time ever in my life. Like I never thought that I would be this happy, that the relationships in my life, the really important ones, would be as amazing and as phenomenal as they are. I confidently can say that I walk in freedom and that I walk in God's grace because I still mess up, but I'm, I'm moving forward in the favor of God. You have been forgiven. Now go into a world that desperately needs forgiveness, healing, and hope. Go be the hope. Amen. Thank you.